Okay, my name's Mike Molina. Uh, I'm the Director of Energy Solutions Associates, uh, which is a building services engineering consultancy that specializes in sustainable engineering and energy management. For building owners to actually make an impact on their own buildings and their own processes, they need to adopt an energy management strategy. Uh, this doesn't have to be complicated, it's quite simple really. They could compare it to their own financial management because there's a lot of similarities between the financial management uh, uh, cy circle, uh, cycle and an energy management cycle. First of all, you've got to start off with understanding what you're actually using. Uh, you'd have no uh, building owner or a business going into uh, a situation where they didn't understand how they were measuring their finance. So there, there should be no difference with their energy. But for some reason, there seems to be a disconnect. So what they should be doing is quantifying how much energy they've been using historically and how much they're using currently. They then need to look at their processes, break it down, so how much they're using on their heating, on their lighting, uh, on their cooling, for example, or any processes on IT, uh, on, on small power, uh, and then start to work out uh, how this compares with similar organisations. So they could use a bit of benchmarking uh, and then find out. Once they've established that information, they then need, they need to act on it. So what they should then do is start to put a program of energy efficiency measures in place. So the best thing to go is, is, is to go for the low-hanging fruit, to go for the things that have a good payback. So one of those things would be reducing energy, and the way to reduce energy, one of the main ways of doing it, would be to get good control of it. So the more that they can put controls in place, the better they can have management of the energy process. Um, so that's the, what they should be doing. Once they've done that, then they can review the results um, and then go back for more. Uh, one of the things that most organizations don't do, which I always recommend, is they need to ring fence their budget to plow their savings back into providing more incentives to save energy. So for example, if they've got a payback on, on um, uh, uh, an upgrade of a building management system and it's paid back in two years, all the savings or a good percentage of those savings should be put in the pot for more investment. So it becomes a self-pump priming uh, self-perpetuating scheme until you reach utopia, which is obviously a long way down the line. It very much depends on which stage you're at within the building process. You'll tend to find that some consultants have a very good understanding of building management systems and would specify them and see the importance. You find that other consultants, and perhaps other building owners or contractors, don't really have that grasp and the, and the understanding of how important building management systems are. The other thing we face in the industry which is really, really worrying is this uh, trend that seems to happen where you get uh, uh, the, the sequence of, what I, of what's known in the industry as value engineering, which I, I term to say is, is more a posh phrase for cost cutting. And, and it's easy to take out controls uh, and important issues like that. Um, to, to reach your budget and that is the worst mistake that building owners or project managers can make because the long-term consequences of not being able to control energy will have a massive knock-on effect for the future. So we need to do a lot more as an industry to educate the fact that, that building controls and building energy management systems uh, should not be uh, taken out of projects and that should be uh, maximised to the full effect uh, throughout any design or refurbishment of uh, any building that we want to be more sustainable and more energy efficient. So I tend to work on something called an energy hierarchy and that works in several stages. First and foremost you need to design uh, a system or a building that uses less energy in the first place. Second and most importantly as well is you need to get control of that energy. So you need to use it wisely, efficiently. Once you've done all that then you can consider renewables or alternative energy. Uh, and that's what we're not doing uh, hard enough with regards to this. A lot of people want to be seen to be green, so therefore they're putting photovoltaics on their roofs, and yet your payback may be seven, eight, nine, ten years. And yet for something like insulation or putting a control system in, or, or inverter drives or something that we're familiar with, um, the, the paybacks for those can be anything between one to three years, which is a far better investment uh, than renewables. Yeah, ma maintenance is very important uh, and again it's one of these areas uh, within the building services industry that is poorly understood by a lot of people. 
I get a lot of facilities managers that say, oh, we want to cut back our maintenance budget because we don't have a budget this year because we've been uh, directed from on high that we need to save 20% of our budget. Uh, and what you tend to find is that the knock-on effect, a bit like with regards to cutting controls out of a, of a project, is the same. I like to say that we want to hand over a building as energy efficient as possible, so therefore we commission it correctly. With maintenance, you could almost say that maintenance needs to go hand in hand with continuous commissioning. Because if you don't have a good maintenance and continuous commissioning regime, you'll tend to find that you'll develop a less energy efficient building. Some people have termed this um, in a way of progressively decommissioning a building um, because they're not doing this. And a good way of, of equating this, uh, which I often say to facilities managers, what do you do every year with your car? And they say, oh, we take it for an MOT and a service. And I say, well, why are your buildings any different? Because you need to maintain that for efficiency. Therefore, the building uses a lot more resources and energy than a car. Therefore, you should adopt the same strategy. So maintenance is obviously very important. Um, and that's the key link between maintenance, commissioning, and energy efficiency, for sure. It's all very well for us as engineers to understand the concepts and, and the realities of, of what the engineering actually can deliver. But we need to get hold of what I call more difficult audiences to reach. We need to find people like facilities managers, explain exactly why energy efficiency is, is very beneficial, how controls can play their part and how they can uh, save a lot of money and a lot of uh, resources in the future. Uh, but above all, we need to get hold of the finance directors. Because the finance directors tend to be the people that set the budgets. They're the people that are interested in preserving the bottom line and also finding ways of, of saving money. So I, I definitely think the industry should be a lot more focused on getting to the people that we normally wouldn't talk to. The current state of the UK energy market is very confused um, and also, um, well, not just confusing, but actually badly structured. Uh, this is all probably post-privatisation of the electricity industry, where we used to have uh, one uh, gas supplier, one uh, electricity supplier, etc. The idea of competition was good, but it led to a lot of uh, confusion um, and uh, way more tariffs than we've ever had before. So for the end user, it is very confusing unless you become an expert in how to deal with this. So it's very good for consultants if they want to uh, add services and stuff, but in terms of uh, uh, structuring the market and how it actually plays out with regards to the costs, um, it, it could be quite difficult. Um, what you tend to find is uh, governments don't look long term it's almost reactionary rather than, well, it's, it's reactive rather than proactive. Uh, they like to think that they have got a program, but every single government in the past and present has ducked the real issues. Again, um, there is a lot of confusion because there are lots of targets. Um, there are various uh, targets that have been laid out by government which are following international agreements such as the Kyoto Protocol, European Buildings Performance Directive, um, all these very, very nice targets in terms of the fact of reducing CO2 emissions uh, by 80% by the, by the year 2050. The intention is good because we have legislation like the building regulations uh, and some of the uh, uh, schemes we've had in the past, for example, the, uh, the CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme, formerly known as the Carbon Reduction Commitment. Uh, the idea was that was to provide a bit of carrot and stick. A lot of this is due to the fact that the government's taken its eye off the ball because of the economy. Um, you know, it's looking to save costs. But what it doesn't realise is if it gets energy efficiency top of the list, it will save more costs uh, and lead on to a whole range of knock-on effects that, that could be very beneficial to the whole country. Okay, legislation over the next three to five years is quite difficult to predict totally because it really depends on uh, A, which government's in place uh, and what's happening to the economy. So they need to be a lot more measured. They need to balance the carrot and the stick and the incentives versus the actual legislation enforcement uh, to make it attractive to people. I tend to find after working in Sweden and Germany that they have definitely got a slight edge on what we're doing. That it's in their culture. A lot of it is to do with the culture and the way uh, that energy is perceived. 
What's happening in Germany is a very good example. Uh, Germans have decided to phase out nuclear power, which is obviously a very bold step. 